Hello and welcome. We're here at Holistic Investments and I'm Konstantin Kogun, your host. And it's our pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, uh, Enrique Sentiero. Uh, so he's a prominent uh, figure in the world of venture capital and investments. Uh, he's currently a senior research manager at Hashkey Capital, a leading global digital asset management firm that focuses on blockchain and crypto uh, related investments. With years of experience in the financial industry, Enrique has a strong track record of identifying and investing in promising startups and companies in the crypto space. Enrique, really happy to have you here. Constantine, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to join the ranks of the amazing guests that you have been having in your podcast. And uh, by the way, you pronounce my name perfectly, which most people don't do it. But <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me again. And uh, very glad to be here. Well, I think we both share like European a little bit like, <laughs> like, like background, so that's easier like for me to to share. And uh, yes, uh, with uh, with this uh, exciting you know news that we're uh, starting together, I have to also remind people that this content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information and, and other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. Now that you know we are <laughs> pro provided this disclaimer we can talk about a lot of things in reiki and thank you so much for you know gracing us for this interview i you know i know that you are part of a, one of the top asian vcs in crypto vcs with over a billion dollar aum uh, you know i've i have known ashkey for many years you know like but it's exciting now to build more you know more relationships and learn from you so you know, before we go into, um, you know, deeper conversation about the industry, about how you approach, you know, the investments, I first want to learn about your professional journey, right? You know, so I, I know that you, it began, in, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Brazil, right? Uh, and Portuguese you know, actually from Portugal. It's Portugal. Okay. So, so, okay. So that's what, that's the thing. Like, you know, I, I want to, I want to know, like, you know, where did you obtain your degree? How did you even start working in crypto? What made you excited about the industry? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Constantine, again, my pleasure to be here. Uh, so I, I started in uh, working in traditional finance. So my, my very first two jobs was in traditional banking. And then I had for a few years my own business. It was a consulting business where I was uh, helping startups to build their business plan and the deck and fundraise from uh, from investors or uh, government grants, bank loans, and so on. Um, but on, on the crypto side, my very first uh, interaction with crypto was actually with Bitcoin 2013. I was for a very brief period of time. Unfortunately, for a brief period of time, I was mining Bitcoin and I gave up because I thought it was not worth it. Um, and then I went back to Bitcoin in 2015. 2015, I was doing a lot of local Bitcoins, you know. Local Bitcoins was this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Bitcoin trading platform where you could buy and sell Bitcoin peer-to-peer. -peer. So I was extremely active uh, on local Bitcoins. Um, sadly, local Bitcoins, uh, they shut down the operations a few weeks ago uh, yeah. because... Um, yeah, in, in the meantime, they were forced to be like all the KYC, all the compliance, and I guess it was not a profitable business anymore. Uh, but it was only in 2017 that I started to work full time in the, in the, in the blockchain space. It started actually with the, uh, you know, that ICO phase. I started to work with a couple of projects. And then back then I was living in Italy and I wanted to continue to work full time in the crypto space. So I started to check worldwide where are the crypto hubs. Uh, and Hong Kong was actually one of the main crypto hubs uh, worldwide back in 2017. So I moved to Hong Kong. Um, I've worked for a couple of startups. Then 2018, we start to have the bear market. During the bear market, I moved to HSBC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have worked for HSBC for two and a half years. I was the project manager implementing the blockchain applications for the bank, but uh, mo mostly uh, dealing with uh, trade finance applications, but it was more like private permissioned blockchain, meaning it was the, let's say, the boring side of the blockchain, right? Uh, <laughs> and then one and a half years ago, I uh, joined Hashkey, uh, Hashkey Capital, um, uh, the research team. So I'm spending part of my time doing research, part of my time talking with uh, cool projects and founders, super exciting space. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really doing what I like to do, which is work uh, and research 
and um, and talk with founders. Other than that, I also have like some personal gigs. I also teach uh, about crypto and blockchain. I teach at HKU, the Hong Kong University. Uh, I also teach online. I have some online courses. I also write some stuff. I have a medium blog and a couple of books. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much what I do. Yeah. No, beautiful. I know you, you did accelerate. You know, like the the, the blockchain training program. Yes, I, I've seen that, and uh, uh, you have an exciting journey for sure. Like you know, and the, the fact that you've been so many years in the industry. I I've started also around 2012, 13, mostly from the trading experience. So like I can share also your your journey a little bit. And right now you're focusing on you know the VC, right? And you know hash key has over 500 portfolio companies right and diff across across all your right somewhere around uh, th 300 300 300 okay uh so okay and and then you you basically go I, I think oh i remember you you evaluate around 500 opportunities and then you pick how many how many do you how many investments do you do per year if you were to kind of evaluate from 500 let's say oh good Question, a good question. But I think per year we we look at way more than five hundred projects for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I would say that we we probably screen over eighty percent of all the projects in the market. So this will be a few thousand projects every year. Wow. Um, yeah. So to give you a bit more like information on like uh, on Hashkey, so we 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 started the first fund in two thousand and uh, late two thousand seventeen. Mm -hmm. um, the first fund was already closed, and the second fund was, uh, in the meantime, fully deployed. Uh, this, the second fund has a U AUM over a billion dollars, and the third fund we have finished fundraising in December, five hundred million dollars. Uh, and across all these three funds, so we have invested in close to three hundred portfolio companies. Um, and um, and in terms of uh, how many projects we look at, probably. Uh, okay, so let me tell you, like second half of last year, during the peak of the bear market, second half of last year, we have invested in 50 projects. So mm -hmm. bear market, 50 projects, so maybe bull market a little bit more, right? Um, but uh, I, I think we believe that this is a good time to build. And if we have opportunity, I would like to tell you a bit more like what I think about the development ecosystem. Yeah. But this is a great time to build, a great time to invest. Uh, from also from an institutional perspective, uh, but probably you look at like thousands of projects to be able to invest in like a uh, hundred of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how many portfolio companies did you invest? Uh, you know, so far, what's the total number? So, portfolio our portfolio at the moment is like close to three hundred. Three hundred total. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so that's that's and so basically, if you if you compute, you know, basically as you mentioned, like it's about fifty per year, right? Like that's in the bear market, right? And then like so in fifty the second half of last year, so sixty fifty in in six months. Fifty in six months, but you say fifty to hundred in a year. Yeah, pr probably close to uh, hundred in. Okay, so that's that's an impressive number, right? You know, and that was. Also, when, like, as you mentioned, bear market, as it slows, slows down, now you raise additional capital, right? So that will allow you to kind of expand your your reach and, uh, I guess, expand, like, the, the team, right? Because there's also an uh, um, amount of people who are the due diligence there, right? So you are in the research team, like, your due, due diligence. How many other people do you have in your team? Uh, okay, so the research team, we are three people. In total for Hashkey Capital, I think we are close to 30 people. Hashkey Group, around 300. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so a capital team, we are divided between the investment team, operations, technical due diligence, research, portfolio management, and investor relations. Got it. So you're in a research team, and that's you have only like you know three people. That that's impressive. Like the amount of like projects you could go over through three people. Wow. How do you how do you cope with this? Let's start from the basics. Like, is there any tricks? Uh, okay, great question. Um, okay, so in terms of projects that we analyze to to invest in, talk with founders. So uh, uh, it's it's basically it's more like the from the investment team perspective. Investment uh -huh. team, we are. Uh, I think 12 people, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. plus uh, the research team, three people more also supporting the investment and also talking with some projects. Um, 
Yeah, it's not easy, you know, because uh, we look at many, many projects um, pretty much every day. And for the founders that are listening to the pod, the advice that I'll give to put your foot in the door in, in when you talk with the VC is, is try to be really concise. Like uh, when you approach uh, a, someone that works for a VC, send a small paragraph and a couple of bullet points of what you do in the key achievements and send a deck that is really, really simple for a 10 year old to, you know, to, to grab the attention. Because if you, if you're a person that you receive five, 10 decks per day, uh, five, 10 pitches from, from VCs, you, you need to, if someone sends you like a big blot of, of text and a extremely wordy deck, it's going to be a bit hard. Probably you can have a, a, the wordy version of the deck or a white paper, but also have a simple version. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. So what's the um, criteria? Let's talk about the criteria, right? So obviously you should be concise and use bullet points and make sure like you know you're straight to the point. But what what makes you really exciting when you open up an email, let's say, right? Somebody pitches you, right? You know, like they don't have an opportunity to meet you. We met in Denver, for example, we met in person, it's easier, right? Now someone who's not catching you, you're in Hong Kong, the person is in Europe. They need to write you a very you know, like cold outreach email, right? Which is more complicated to get excited. And like, you know, so, so what are the things that, you know, like make you excited? Is it a product market fit team? Maybe some metrics that you, you particularly looking at? Yeah. You know, I think we, we need to have a holistic investment approach, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about holistic investment. Um, yeah, so we really try to look at the projects from a, on a holistic perspective. But like you said, it's product market fit. It's trying to understand what's the, the, the problem and solution that you are providing to the market. What's the, the addressable market? Do you have already users or not? Uh, who is the team behind it? Um, if you have some metrics, it's great to share some metrics. Like if you have some traction, some monthly active users, uh, if you have fundraised in the past, you have... Uh, uh, engagement, uh, wallets, uh, TVT, it's great to share. But if you don't have a TVT, it's also fine. Just uh, try to highlight what's the problem and solution that you are solving, uh, what makes you better than the competitors, and uh, try to be really concise. Um, and uh, personally, when I meet founders, it, I think it's all about the excitement that the founders have about their own products, right? You Usually you can see, like, the Founders that are really the, usually the, the, the long-term winners in the market, they have their eyes are shining when they talk about the product they developed and they are they really like it, right? Passionate about it. That makes a big difference when you're talking comparing to founders where you are 30 minutes into the meeting and I don't understand where, yet what they do, right? What what's the product about? Um yeah, but uh, we, we look at many different metrics. Uh, but it's more like a, a, a holistic uh, approach, uh, trying to look at everything that is available, if possible, some traction. Uh, depending also on the market trends, we we might uh, focus in certain sectors. Uh, and our research team, one of the goals is to support uh, the investment team in terms of understanding what are the market trends, what are the technologies, the emerging technologies that uh, might be uh, interesting to, to invest in. So, so let's talk about this part. I think this is interesting. If you would objectively, as much as you can, right, you know, to try to analyze what are the trends that you believe will be in the next big thing. Right now, obviously, we're in this like cycle of AI. Anything that is like going to AI is like hot all of a sudden. And unfortunately, you know, some of the projects that are funded, that's probably not the best projects, but still have an AI component and they're still investable, right? Now, Soon, I think it's we're slowly winding down this like you know hype of the AI. What is going to be the next thing? Like, are you focused on I don't know zk rollups, wallet, socialify? I don't know gamify. What, what do you what are you excited about? Oh man, so many things. Uh, let me start. Uh, we are excited about scalability and mm -hmm. layer twos, for example. We are excited about infrastructure, so Web three infrastructure, gaming infrastructure. Uh, because like there are new ways to do things in infrastructure is what's going to let, take us to the next level uh, during the next bull market. I'm excited about DeFi, tokenization of real world assets. 
uh, under collateralized or uncollateralized DeFi lending. Um, what else? Account abstraction. I think you have mentioned that account abstraction because also account abstraction is a way of bringing uh, more users to the space. Uh, ZK technology, because um, you just talked also we, uh, about AI, right? I think the combination of AI, ZK technology, and blockchain can be interesting to do some stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I think are kind of those are the areas that we are now uh, excited the most about. Uh, we also look a bit at, at gaming, um, but I guess gaming and metaverse was a little bit more hot like one and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still have some good projects out there. Yeah. So so let's talk about each part like separately, right? So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm curious about here more account abstraction because I, I don't think a lot of people actually know about it enough. So I want you to give us maybe a, a basic crush course. What is it and why you think that's the next big thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, account abstraction. So there, there, there is a new category when it, when it comes to uh, wallets that support account abstraction. There is a new category of wallets that uh, are quite different from, let's say, uh, the uh, MetaMask wallets that probably most of the people listening to pod uh, use. Right? When like when you create a new when you install MetaMask in your computer, the first thing you need to do is to write in a piece of paper the twenty four uh, seed phrase words and keep them in a safe place or put them in a in a thing like this, you know, in a metal seed phrase storage thing. Yes. <laughs> um, because like you may have a fire or a flood and a piece of paper might disappear, right? And while this one, it doesn't disappear. Um, so it's not very easy for normal web two users, right? Normal web know. two users <laughs> to, to go click uh, Gmail or put the email and password in, that's it. So what account abstraction uh, wallets allow you to do, like uh, wallets like Argent, uh, is to create a wallet and um, and abstract that uh, seed phrase part. So you put your email, your password, and you have a very uh, web two uh, experience. But these wallets are fully non custodial wallets. So uh -huh. you still control, have full control over your crypto. It's not a third party. It's not an exchange. Not a centralized party. We have full control of your crypt over your crypto. But uh, the wallet is backed up with other technologies like we have uh, also something called mpc multi-party computing um and it's going to like break down uh the seed that created the, the the seed phrase and put it somewhere else in a in a safe place yeah so it keeps you secure basically you were talking about external um you know own externally owned accounts right you know which are in some ways provided the opportunity to um to be flexible, right? And but yet define your security rules and your level of comfortability when you can recover your account if you lose the keys, as you mentioned, because this is one of the biggest mess. Like I, I remember one of my first drama was when I was moving from one apartment to another and I lost the seed phrase with, you know, I think one or two bitcoins. I mean, it was just <laughs> I, I think we all went there through it, right? So in in, in a certain way. So this basically allows you to share your account security across trusted devices or even individuals, right? So I think that's another th important factor, like, you know, because, you know, I right now, like I was thinking about one of the issues, like, you know, what happens, God forbid, if something like if I will be like, you know, not operational, God forbid, if something happens with me, like all well, my crypto, I would not be even be able to explain my, let's say, my mother or someone else, how to use the seed phrase, right? Which makes it very complex, right? And, uh, but I want to allow someone to participate in this, like, and trust someone. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, uh, you had the EIP 4337 mm -hmm. that was announced, in fact, during the week, uh, during the East Denver week, right? Where we met. And the EIP uh, 4337, I think, uh, I might need to do a bit more research, but it solves the the, the problem that you were just talking about because it allows yes. you to authorize uh, other third parties to spend, um, and uh, it allows also for these uh, paymasters. And you can, for example, automate a, a monthly payment. You can pay like okay, have a for example Netflix subscription. I pay every month, so I can uh, 
authorize uh, this kind of payments. Um, yeah. So the EIP 4337, it, it really brings uh, more things and also like uh, be able to eventually pay gas fees with uh, other assets and uh, uh, or allow a smart contract or, or, or a project to sponsor the gas fees. Yes, that, that's super interesting. Yeah, so it's multi-sig authorization in a way. What you're mentioning, right? You know, where you can have, you can actually share credentials across the multiple trusted people, like right? you know, or even companies, right? You know, so that's I think very important, which was missing. And then you can whatever you can, you have the consensus of let's say several parties, like you know, uh, they can freeze the account or recover the account, or they can block a certain transaction, which is also very useful, like you know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what you guys are using, which multi-sig solution you, you prefer, right? Cause I think, um, that's also, uh, very important for, for us. For example, one of the easiest solution was mass is safe. That's how we started. And I think that's a pretty popular solution. And I'm curious, like, if there are any other things that you see are, are useful to manage not only a hedge fund, but also your personal finance. Uh, great question. So I, I think from like more from an institutional perspective, from the from the uh, hash key perspective, um, we need to rely in crypto custodians. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so we have crypto custodians like uh, Hextrust um, or many others that are uh, in the market where they basically uh, they keep the custody of your crypto and they have all the infrastructure to keep it uh, to keep it safe. Uh, and there is no commingling of funds or anything like that. So it's not the same as living it in an exchange or mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, at the personal level, uh, yeah, you, you, you have talked about Gnosis. Um, yeah, I haven't explored, to be honest, m most of those things. Like personally, I'm, I'm more into like cold storage uh, wallets like Ledger, Trezor, uh, I have now a Keystone, a Keystone wallet, which is a, like fully air gapped wallet, so there is no way to connect it to your computer. It's mm. kind of kind of cool. Um, yeah, so I think those are kind of the the solutions that are most, uh, widely used. Got it. So yeah, if if we jump into the uh, you know the the ecosystem of ha Hashkey, right? So you mentioned so you you use you, first of all you have your own custodian, which is like a SFC Hong Kong SFC license, right? You know, and uh, so that means it's a registered custodian, right? And then I'm sure um, that helps you to be compliant on an institutional level, right? Uh, but if you if you would advise a project that or seed stage project comes to you, right? And uh, man, would you still advise them to use, you know, like a licensed custodian? Or would you advise them to use a combination of multi-sig and cold storage? Yeah, I think I think most of the the the, the licensed custodians in the market are pretty solid. Um, so Hashkey Capital, we actually we don't use our own custodian, the the Hashkey Group <laughs> custodian. Interesting. Okay, but there is a good reason. There is a good reason for that. It's like to avoid conflicts of interest. Is basically that's the, the main reason. And, and the the agreement that we have with our investors, with our LPs, is to use a third party custodian, just to make sure there is no conflict interest of, of interest at all. Um, uh, yeah, but um, you, you know we have many, I would say, reliable so far custodians. Uh, I told you about Hextras, you have Bitco, Coinbase Custody, Matrix Port, um, and um, yeah, and I think for projects just to remove the headache of, of dealing with multi-signature wallets, I think those are, 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 are pretty solid, I think. Got it. Okay. No, so that's actually interesting that you don't use your own. Like it is, it's, I think it's very noble <laughs> and smart because yes, as you mentioned, remove the conflict of interest. So obviously custody, custody is a, uh, is a, is more boring topic. So, so <laughs> even though it's important, right? So I want us to talk about something fun also, right? So, uh, I want you to, you know, just to, uh, maybe without, uh, saying a name of the company, but maybe to share with us some exciting pitch that you recently had, right? You know, like that maybe a cold outreach that you were personally really like 
reading an email, let's say, and you're like, oh, wow, that's, I want to talk to these guys, right? <laughs> what made you like feel like that? Okay, I want to talk to these people. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so the first that comes to my mind, uh, okay, probably I, I, I will not be able to share the name because of course. We, 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 we haven't invested yet in the yes. still like conversation <laughs> phase, but um, it was actually a project that I, I, I've i saw like in crypto YouTube, I, I've seen this game before and then I, re and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. It looks like really, really nice game. Um, Looks solid, solid team. And then I, they, they, they just sent me a cold. I don't know if it was an email or social media, something like that. I received their pitch and I was like, oh, okay, this is actually interesting. And then I go talk with the founders. Again, super passionate founders. That's one. The other was, uh, although it's gaming, what they are solving is the infrastructure layer. So they are a gaming studio. They are developing a couple of games, but the most interesting is the infrastructure layer because you know games games fail, right? Even big game developers, AAA gaming studios, they spend millions and millions of dollars in three years developing a game, and then the game is a flop. So it's very hard to bet in a single game. But if you are developing also an infrastructure layer where you can have other game developers, other indie game developers connecting to your infrastructure, then that's another story. So what they are doing is creating these infrastructure layers that allow any Web2 game or new Web3 game to connect and abstract uh, the, the the blockchain layer from the user. So they have the DIDs, they have a, a wallet, and for so for a, for a, for a for a normal user web two user, you can go play the game. You log in, you create a wallet without even knowing that you are creating a. a I think it's in this case they are on Polygon, without even knowing that you are creating a Polygon wallet. Then you go play the game. Imagine you win a car during the game. Uh, you can create an NFT. You can create transform this car into an NFT just by doing a drag and drop. Then mm -hmm. and you create then create the NFT. And then you can sell it in the marketplace. Um, and you know, it's super simple and this infrastructure layer is super interesting and other games can connect to it. And um and and that's why I like I like these kind of infrastructure uh, projects. Not only in the gaming space, but other sectors, because infrastructure will always kind of be there. The infrastructure you can have 10, 15 a uh, hundred different projects connecting to that infrastructure, while individual games or individual gaps, uh, dApps are, well, they are a little bit more risky because they are one individual uh, app. Mm -hmm. So no, that's an, a beautiful example. So again, the te technology and the simplicity excited you, the solution, right? The actual like solution to the problem that like, as I, as I understood, the product market fit and the user experience that is seamless and also scalable, right? Now, if we talk about other pitfalls that a lot of startups are coming from, you know, like as you mentioned, 2021, there was metaverse hype and there's a lot of projects that were having crazy valuations. Right now, we're in a kind of almost like still a bear market in a way, right? It's getting better, but still a bear market. Now, the valuations went down, right? So, but still, there's always like this dilemma, right? The founders who had previous negotiations, right? And they still try to um, maintain the status quo, right? Not to go too low at the valuation. And obviously there is a, a difference in incentives. As a VC, you would prefer probably the valuation would be lower this market. As a founder, they want higher. So maybe let's talk about a little bit about how, what is the perfect equilibrium, right? <laughs> Where the valuation should be. Okay, that's a great, great question. So I think like in some aspects, actually, valuations didn't change that much if the project has metrics and on-chain metrics. Mm -hmm. Comparing to uh, what we used to have like um, one and a half years ago the, before the um, the bear market, uh, the valuations are kind of in, in par with the on-chain metrics. So the projects that have already some on-chain metrics like wallet activity, number of transactions, developer activity, uh, 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 earnings, uh, on-chain revenue, right? Uh, compared to 
the valuations that you used to have uh, one and a half years ago, they didn't change much. Of course, like, okay, if the um, uh, transaction activity decreased by 50%, probably the valuation also decreased by 50%, but they are still in par mm -hmm. with, uh, with the on-chain metrics. Now, projects that don't, don't have any metrics, um, yeah, the valuations kind of drop a bit, um, but... Uh, Probably like th that's not like the most like important metric that we look at. Mm -hmm. um, I think projects that are successful projects, um, they, they they will win and survive no matter what's the valuation. So okay, if the project between the project has, has like ten million valuation or thirteen or fifteen million valuation and it doesn't have much metrics yet, well, if that project is going to be a unicorn, there is no much difference at the end in terms of the you know, uh, it, it doesn't make that much difference. So we, we, I don't think we battle too much with, with valuations. Well, I, I give you an example. There is like, imagine there's like the project was invested partially in 2021. We, I, we just talked to a project that had like over $50 million valuation. And now they have a dilemma, right? Now they're in a different market. They need to raise more money. And it's really hard for them psychologically to go down, right? You know, but nobody wants to accept the same valuation. So... So the logical solution would be to go to the investors who are already there and say, like, guys, we want to lower the, the valuation, we want to raise more funds, and that's actually better for them because they took a risk. But, you know, now they get, like, more money. But the founders don't want to do it, right? So for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, so my question to you, what would be your advice in such cases? Because I'm sure you probably came across sometimes this uh yeah good question um well that that that's a hard one i i think like if you can still fundraise from your existing investors and they do a follow-on investment that's a even if it is a lower valuation it's still a good sign it means that they still believe that your project has a future uh it's just that you know, unexpected market circumstances and we are in the bear market and it, maybe it will take longer to, to gain the traction or expand uh, the way you were thinking. Uh, but um, yeah, I think first, of course, go to the, your existing investors and um, and if they are on board, um, yeah, why not? It's be better than that than not being able to <laughs> raise it all got it yeah so we have similar advice but sometimes you know they don't want to uh for also obvious reasons because you know yeah. if they get a lower valuation they get almost like a double allocation or one and a half so for them it's also misalignment of incentives but let me ask you another question which is also i think interesting equity versus tokens right so there is now another i wouldn't call it a dilemma but like a a, a thought process right the infrastructure projects for them sometimes it makes more sense to actually first raise equity and then tokens with token warrants potentially right and some of the projects doing only tokens right and those are different cap tables and sometimes there is also conflict of interest between different groups of investors right and misalignment of like you know how it will be distributed what's the exit strategy so um can you talk a little bit about this like what in your opinion is the perfect like scenario yeah um yeah i think like for example one and a half two years ago uh it was more common to invest only in tokens now at the moment for the last maybe six months one year is more common to invest in equity uh, but i think at the end it depends where is the value accrual for the project um, and there are some projects that are more obvious to go to token. Other projects are more obvious to go to equity. Okay, for example, uh, if you have a CFI, uh, a centralized exchange, probably you just go for the uh, equity. Uh, while if you have a different protocol, it's probably more like towards the, the token incentive. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, like there are many projects that can have eventually both, uh, and they they it, and it, it's very normal. For example, to invest at the moment in equity, and the project plans to have a token sometime in the future once the market conditions are a little bit better. So we have a token warrant, and um, and 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 in the future, once the project has a token, we can have eventually an allocation with that uh, with that mm -hmm. token. 
Let me ask you a more provocative question. So I had I heard this criticism for several investors. I'm curious to hear your opinion. Uh, basically, uh, basically, if we think about it right now, like a lot of people are saying, like, well, we're not even excited to invest in equity, right? We were excited to invest in tokens for the reason being that we don't foresee many crypto companies to ever go public. Like, so for them, the only option is like basically merge and acquisition, right? Which is also not an easy route if we think about it, right? So, um, so can you talk a little bit about like how do you even see the exit strategy when you invest in equity? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. The, the exit is a little bit harder. Like you said, there are not that many companies in the crypto space that uh, have done an IPO. Uh, uh, and yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, but there are other things like you can can be acquired by uh, that's probably a little bit more common can be acquired by a competitor or or or, or some other third party that wants to make an integration um, and there are also some um, private equity uh, secondary market equity uh, platforms that allow you to buy and sell uh, equity in the secondary market pre IPO. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there is this company called Gateway. Uh, if you search, like, there, there are more, of course, but uh, this one is 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 located in Hong Kong, and this Gateway pre-IPO uh, equity market allows you to, you know, to eventually sell your equity uh, pre-IPO. Of course, it's way less liquid than post-IPO, but uh, that can be also a, a solution. Yeah. But then, so so that's pre-IPO, right? You know, if we're talking about those companies, you know, that are, you know, they can generate revenue. They can have like, let's say, I don't know, 20, 50 million dollar in revenue. And so they're not even like close to getting to IPO. It doesn't make a lot of sense. There are somewhere in between, between being like a very successful business, right? But not still up to the par, up to the level of going to IPO, right? So what would you advise those companies? Like, how would you, help, how would you maybe advise them to strategize like to be acquired like what, what would be your kind of like suggestion to those companies yeah uh, but i think even those companies they can have like uh, uh even though they are not close to ipo they they can eventually sell equity in the in the uh, in these kind of secondary market platforms but yeah uh, well i think the thing is to be like to be so sexy and attractive that the competitor comes and <laughs> and acquires them um i don't know like uh w one of the interesting investments that um you know that we have uh, done last year was is in this hong kong company called rip so we we invested in equity rip is basically um a, a credit card company where you can settle your credit card with crypto and they have also on ramp off ramp and they serve not only in the hong kong market but also uh I think pretty much they can serve any company globally. Um, and now at the moment, you know, because crypto companies are having such a hard time to have access to banking, right? To traditional banks. These kind of companies like RIP, where you can make the payments, you can do payroll using the card, you can do everything you want, and you can settle the credit card with crypto. These kind of companies are super interesting. And uh, they are going very, growing very fast. And I see them probably like, because the, the business is so interesting, being acquired by a larger institution, eventually a larger financial institution that wants to to get involved in crypto in a compliant way. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's the, the the way to go. Is like having such a good product, so interesting that mm -hmm. you can like increase the likelihood of being acquired. Got it. So no, that's I think that's a great advice. You know, so that like you just build understanding who's your customers and in this case yes whatever hedge funds prop shops i don't know banks would be interested in those products right if you're talking about let's say more of a of a gaming uh angle like you know for example the studios that are that have multiple games right you know so who do you think for them can be a good acquisition partner Cindy, to be honest i didn't think much about about <laughs> this uh <laughs> It's good, like that. Not you see, that's catch, not, catch. <laughs> I'm catching you off guard. No, it's good, like because you know th th that's that's the thing. Like we, uh, we also gaming, yeah, 
there is a lot of great studios that are traditional studios who actually produce amazing games, right? And and then of course, like someone like Animoca Brands also work with them, and then a few other like big conglomerates that are like all very focused on the publishing business on the gaming side, right? And and you know that's that's an amazing business and it's a very scalable business. We have like mm -hmm. billions of gamers, right? You know, and it's, I'm sure it's still very early in web three, but the, the acquisition part, like, you know, there's only a few players who actually play in this field, right? You know, that's the, that's what we came up with. Like it's challenging task to have um, infrastructure, a bit easier, right? Ecosystems also can be interested in them. Um, and do you see, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, do you see some um, some really competitor edge of one or another ecosystem in terms of like, you know, uh, different chains? Obviously, EVM, I think, still are uh, winning the game in a way, right? Ethereum, just by numbers, like and by the number of decentralized applications built on top of it is number one, right? You know, but... Do you foresee some chain in, that is in your opinion that is coming right now? You, men you mentioned layer two that in your opinion will dominate in the future. Uh, yeah. Okay. I love that question, Constantin. So ooh, where to start? Um, <laughs> there are different parts to that, you know. Um, one, like starting with the Ethereum chain, I'm super excited. We just came well, uh, yesterday or before yesterday from the Shanghai or Chappelle uh, upgrade, right? Mm -hmm. So now uh, we can move forward with the upcoming upgrades on the Ethereum blockchain. So now the Ethereum blockchain, you are able to unstake uh, or withdraw the the, the block the, the rewards that the validators have. Uh, by the way, I was looking at the metrics and it seems that we almost have already more deposits than withdrawals, which is pretty cool. People were so afraid, right, uh, yeah. uh, of like, having so many withdrawals uh, that could impact uh, the price. But in fact, the price is, has been going up like crazy over the twenty four hour, yes. the last 24 hours. And um, I see a new layer being built on the top of the Ethereum chain. Now that you have the Shanghai upgrade, um, like, for example, products like Igen layer, where you will have be able to have shared security. So you will be able to stake and your stake will be able to secure the Ethereum blockchain, but also eventually other chains. And this is super interesting because it will bring uh, huge capital efficiencies in the market because at the moment it's still a little bit capital inefficient sometimes. Um, and it, I also see this happening in the future. Like in the future, I don't think it makes sense to not having ETH stakes, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Because like if you have things like shared security, and liquid staking and so on. Why having ease other than a little bit to pay the gas fees? It doesn't make sense not to stake your uh, ease. And then we are preparing the road for uh, the vertical trees or the, the the upgrade that will allow to have uh, to be a necessary less computation to validate transactions on the Ethereum chain, uh, and maybe having light nodes so you could run like probably a node on your uh, mobile phone. And then after that, maybe one or two years ahead, uh, the sharding, where we have 64 shard chains and the Ethereum goes from being able to, uh, I don't know, manage like 20 transactions per uh, second or so to like hundreds of thousands of transactions in way more modular. Uh, so blockchain modularity is something also very important, right? And I see the Ethereum chain, although at the moment is not very modular, in the future being more modular and allowing developers to tweak the chain that they use depending on the needs. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see nowadays like this uh, app chain trends, like applications because like on the Ethereum chain is not modular yet. So some of these applications moving, for example, to Cosmos, DYDX is moving to, uh, to Cosmos because they will be able to have a chain that is built according to their needs, right? Because on Cosmos, you can use the Cosmos SDK to create uh, a chain according to whatever are your needs, right? That's why I'm also very excited about the Cosmos ecosystem, also very excited about Polkadot because it allows developers to, uh, one, to have more interoperability between the chains 
of that ecosystem and also allow you to have more modularity to build according to your needs. So anyone can go and create a Cosmos chain now. And with the Cosmos interchain security, you are, although you can eventually bootstrap at the very beginning with very little number of nodes, you can uh, inherit the security from uh, other nodes that are securing other chains on the Cosmos ecosystem. So that's one like one of the interesting ecosystems. And then like I I'm also looking at you know Aptos, Sui, the new move chains. That's also quite interesting. And um, uh, so new projects that build in these chains uh, early stage uh, usually perform also uh, very well, very well. And then, like other chains that I'm, I'm also looking at are the layer twos, especially uh, zk rollups. So um, you have zk sync and uh, and and Starknet, and they are you you again you look at these ecosystems that are building now, and they are all the DApps that uh, move early to these projects usually perform quite well. Mm -hmm. um, not saying that from the venture capital perspective, not all these dApps, not all these DeFi protocols that move early stage to these uh, uh, new layer twos uh, are investable opportunities because sometimes they are just a fork from whatever, from, from the Ethereum chain, from a Uniswap or whatever, they just fork it and migrate it to uh, ZK Sync. And that's not like the kind of project where we invest. But sometimes even from an individual invest perspective, they sometimes are a little bit interesting because they are early in a new ecosystem. So yeah, new ecosystems like uh, uh, like the ZK rollups uh, ecosystems, uh, Aptos and Sui, um, and also uh, Ethereum modularity in the future, uh, and uh, cross-chain security projects like uh, Cosmos and Polkadot. Uh, and then I think we have like a, a lot of like... Uh, indicators that show that uh, layer twos are really growing a lot. Um, you have recently, a couple of weeks ago, right, the Arbitrum airdrop and mm -hmm. Arbitrum surpri su surpassed uh, optimism or more than tripled the optimism, uh, the number of transactions per day. Uh, I don't know the, the most recent numbers, but a couple of weeks ago, they were having like 1.5 million transactions per day, which is like really huge so yeah that kind of ecosystem quite interesting so so if i would ask you uh, again i will ask a more provocative question um on the long run your you, your bet if you are now have a chance to build an optimus versus arbitrum what would be your choice oh, okay <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh you know uh, <laughs> that's a hard one I know. I, I think if, if 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 I was at this precise moment building like a DeFi protocol, I, I might go to Arbitrum because I think the number of active users, active wallets, the number of transactions, and and the TVL is also growing very fast. Um, I don't know. Let me quickly check on on DeFi Llama. If we check the the TVL on DeFi Llama um, of Arbitrum, I think probably they they they. They more than double the the TVL over the last. Uh, okay, so since the beginning of the year, they went from a TVL of one billion dollars to now two point three billion dollars. So they more than double in like in in three months, right? Uh, while Arbitrum probably didn't grow so fast. Um, sorry, uh, uh, Optimism. Yes. Um, yeah. Our, uh, optimism is at the moment close to a billion dollars TVL, but they are both amazing ecosystems. And okay, one of the ways I'd say before building a DeFi protocol to understand which chain should you deploy to uh, Arbitrum or Optimism. Okay, go to the major, go to the top ten uh, DeFi uh, projects. Go to Ave, MakerDAO, and 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 uh, and Curve and Uniswap and um, Compound and all these projects and check their governance forum and see what, what are people talking about? Are people asking to deploy on, on Optimism, to deploy in Arbitrum? Uh, what was their choice before? What was rational? Because looking at these uh, um, these proposals, the governance proposals in the governance forum will give you a very good indicator what people think about, um, about the ecosystem, yeah. That's actually a good advice, right? You know, so change the TVL, change, look at the community, 
Uh, and I just, you know, I was right now on NFT NYC, like, you know, there's like some other representatives that are, people are giving out grants, right? You know, the ecosystem are pro- can give you grants to build on top of their uh, layer two solution. So reach out to them and explore this opportunity, right? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, cause I think it's important, you know, when, when you're still not sure, like even, and, you know, developers not always have an opportunity to raise like millions of dollars. They need some bootstrapping, like, you know, at least a few hundred K, uh, that, that can be like, I think grants are like not around like hundred to 250 K not, not more probably. So, but that should be enough to build an MVP and to prove that you have something. And also very important. After they get the grant, they should talk with you to be eventually incubated by you. Yes. By your yes. incubator. <laughs> yes, I appreciate I appreciate it. Yes. We're actually, yes, we're in talks with some other ecosystems. Right now we mostly work with EVM chains also, like you know, you know, we integrated 17. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we're happy, happy to talk to anyone who's like, you know, who's who's needed support because we, we can we can help with those. Um now. Obviously, you know, there are a lot of topics we can cover, right? You know, and there are a lot of things we can talk about. And we can, uh, that's, that's an exciting part. But there's something like I want to talk to you on a personal level. And I specifically never notify uh, the people I have a conversation as and my interviewees, like, you know, about this question, because I want it to be as genuine as possible, right? So, um, so don't be completely <laughs> like surprised by this question. But because, as you as you notice, the name of holistic investments, uh, and it goes beyond just the fact that we just live in a corporeal material world where you just like talk about numbers, projects. I want to ask you about another important question, which is meaning. Like, I want to ask you, what's the meaning of life to you? <laughs> All right, because uh, <laughs> that's wow. Um, you know, like I, I think, like. Professionally, I, I I see my my mission is to uh, to teach and spread the word and invest in blockchain to try to change the world for the better. Uh, so I really do a lot of a lot of teaching in the in the in the crypto space. I'm extremely active uh, also in that space. But I think the meaning of life is, is just to do meaningful stuff and and be your best self to to help others and to have a better more positive impact in the world so how can you maximize your impact in the world your positive impact well you are maximizing your impact by doing an amazing podcast uh, that have tens of thousands of followers uh, you are doing it by investing in the crypto space by having an incubator uh, and and i'm kind of uh, you know doing the same um and there is a lot of work behind the scenes to do this. You know, I, I'm also into like more the uh, the health part and 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 longevity mm-hmm. because I I want to try to live as much as possible to continue to do a very meaningful work. You know, guys like Elon Musk. I I, I wish Elon Musk lives 200 years, right? Because like that guy is amazing. Like he's doing the work of 100 people in a single man, right? So it will be great if. Elon Musk can live like a very, very long and healthy life. And I'm far from being Elon Musk, but I'm trying to hack like some some uh, biohacking to try to extend the healthy uh, lifespan, you know, and uh, and try to continue having a positive impact in the world. Beautiful. No, that's that's actually a very 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 good analogy like i'm also a big supporter of elon i think like what he's doing is amazing uh, and very important for the evolution of humanity and and if i would um if i may ask you also maybe one book that changed your life or somehow impacted you that you would advise to let's say your 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 kids you know to read what one of the most important books oh uh <laughs> Uh oh wow um let me think I'm not sure but uh you know probably the, the the some of the books that changed my life are the books that I wrote and because it was a lot of work and uh, <laughs> I, I I I wouldn't find it like selfish <laughs> that if you would say that this is my book because I've invested like I don't know three years of my life 
to make a research. Totally fine if it can be your book. Yeah, but it kind of changed in a way, like kind of uh, made me uh, aware and learn how to write and be more uh, aware that I actually like to write. I think I, if you ask me 10 years ago, would you like to be like a professional writer? And like, oh no, that's so fucking boring. I will never be like a professional writer. But now after writing these first three books, that uh, no, no big deal. Like one is a blockchain book, the other is an NFT book, and the third is like a sci-fi uh, romance. But it's really teach me like how to uh, enjoy uh, writing. So at the moment, I really enjoy writing, and I I can't wait to just kind of retire and be like a full-time writer. <laughs> but in terms of like uh, real books, not like my hobbies, uh, real books that I've enjoyed really reading. Um, I don't know. There is a number of books. Maybe, you know, when I was maybe 19, 20 years old, I read pretty much all the Ayn Rand's books, mm -hmm. uh, Atlas Shrugged and so on. Right. And uh, I think that was that was very impactful. Uh, I also like Marcus Aurelius' meditations and stuff like that. I even like tattoo Mar Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe like more recent books that I read that are kind of interesting. Um, okay. Uh, Deep Work is a great book. Uh, Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half Time, something like that, is also a very interesting book. Um, Measure What Matters from uh, Steve Doerr. No, what's his name? Michael Doerr. He's like also a VC guy. Uh, the Power Law, also a very interesting book. Uh, also talking about investment in venture capital. Oh, and and there is this book of, uh, from um, Jason Calicani's uh, uh, Angel. Amazing book. If you are into investing and if you are into like uh, angel investing or even VC, uh, this book Angel from Jason Calicani's, it's an amazing book yes. uh, that I also uh, read. I, I, don't, I don't read books. I listen only the other books, but uh, also pretty cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, uh, you know, audiobooks right now is also an opportunity. People have so such a fast pace, you know, so, um, no, thank you. I think those are more than enough for people to have like a one month reading material, right? So, um, re seriously, Enrique, really excited, really, uh, you know, really learned a lot from you it's uh, it's been a pleasure like and i know we can talk for hours i just want to make sure like we do we maybe uh reserve it for the other uh podcast we do maybe later to to keep a uh, keep other topics alive you know like i oh my god i feel that i have so many more topics to talk with you yeah <laughs> i i'm sure and this is like i feel the same like but i but this, this is the reason why i feel like we need to we need to uh pace ourselves like you know and they make sure that you know people are like digesting what we discussed right now obviously i'll share all the links to your profile like you know where is the best like you know what what is the best medium if people want to contact you is it linkedin email twitter uh yeah probably linkedin and twitter you can just if you google search my name you'll find uh, my uh, linkedin and twitter um i always reply to all the messages it might be slow sometimes but uh <laughs> Yeah, feel free to to, to reach out. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I'll share all the the messages. I I I will also share links to your books, to your research. You know, like, and I'm sure people would love to even just like learn from you of your perspective of crypto as a person who's been in the industry for quite a while, right? You know, and now is part of the one of the top VCs. Really appreciate your time, Enrique. I I, I wish that you will find more unicorns and. As you mentioned, we'll change the world for it to be a better place, you know, like to, and then you will live at least like 200 years. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Thanks, Constantine. It was really, really a pleasure. And I wish you the same. Thank you.